Okay, if I can have all of your attention, please. So thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, my name is Barnelli Chaudhary, and I am the director of the Nathanson Center. Before we get started, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. So we recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Ashinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Before we get going, I'd like to introduce our Dean, Trevor Farrow, to give us a couple of uh, introductions about this lecture and then to speak about our speaker. Uh, Trevor? <laughs> Uh, Nathanson Center for organizing uh, the Or Emmett Lecture. Now, the lecture um, is presented annually uh, by Osgood's uh, Nathanson Center um, with the assistance of the Or Emmett Fund. The fund, which was established in 1976, seeks to promote through public discussion, research, and scholarly writing. Um, public and professional appreciation for the significance of religion, ethics, culture, and history in the development of the legal system. As I understand it, or Emmet means the light of truth. Um, and it seems to me uh, uh, particularly, it's always important and a particularly moment, uh, important moment as we uh, think about these really foundational uh, issues uh, in our time. It's uh, with a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Robert McCorkadale. Um, Professor McCorkadale, former dean, uh, is a member of the United Nations Working Group on Business and Human Rights, um, a five-member group on independent experts. And I should say before I start uh, that uh, it's not his fault that we're starting late. Um, apparently, in one of those lovely moments, I'm sure, for a speaker who's prepared to be somewhere on time, there's some police event out in front of a hotel. Uh, so um, quick thinking jumps on the subway and still here. So thank you for persevering uh, and getting here. Um, professor McCorkadale is an Emeritus Professor of International Law and Human Rights uh, at the University of Nottingham. Uh, and a barrister and mediator at Brick Court Chambers in London. Uh, he has over 30 years of experience working in business and human rights, He's published widely in this area, including through empirical research and has advised businesses of all size and assisted governments uh, and civil societies around the world. Um, I'm not sure we could have a better speaker for today's event. It's with great pleasure, uh, Professor McCorkadale, that I welcome you to the stage and to Osgood Hall Law School. Thank you very much, Trevor, for that warm welcome. Um, I know the role of Dean is not always so easy to do all these things, and I do appreciate your time very much. And particular thanks to Benali and to Liel, who's enabled me to be here and been very um, much uh, helpful in, in all this organization. And um, it's wonderful to see Benali here in Canada. I also want to thank friends and wonderful colleagues from all over the world who are here uh, today. That's great to see that kind of, there's a real camaraderie in the business and human rights field, and it's lovely to see so many of you. Now, I'm conscious this is a public lecture, so I'm going to try and do both general statements about um, particular area of business human rights, but also some, obviously, analysis at different points. So hopefully that's um, uh, relatively uh, clear uh, for those of you who aren't that familiar with this area. Um, so let me begin. For any of you who studied international human rights law, this is kind of the way it's looked at. It's all about state actions and state responsibility. That is the classic parameter. And largely, even if you're taught international human rights law today, that's kind of what you'll see. And so that's my starting point. It's not my ending point. 
But let me just give you an example. State action, the uh, Convention Against Torture defines torture in this particular way, in which the perpetrator is defined as a public official or other person acting in an official capacity. But if you happen to be um, in an area of, say, Colombia during the period when the FARC were in charge, and you were caught by them, you had fingernails torn off, you had electrodes put on your body, it would feel like torture. But under international human rights treaty law, it would not be torture. Why? Because they're not public officials or person acting in an official capacity. So the difficulty of a lot of international human rights law, it's a very binary idea, the state and the individual, or occasionally the group. So, but that's the structure traditionally of international human rights law. And the responsibility then lies with the state for that action. And so, for example, during an era which sadly still goes on in places like Nigeria, where oil companies are doing great damage environmentally into the, the local communities, your only recourse for many decades was against the state. And so, for example, in this case brought by the social and economic uh, um, group against Nigeria before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, what do we find? The only thing the Commission can say, even referring to private parties, oh, it's gone on too far, sorry, it does sometimes do this, let's see if I can go back. No. Oh, still going. Left arrow. Left arrow. Ah. Thank you. Um, the only thing they can say is the Nigerian government has been given a green light to these private actors, particularly as they say expressly, the oil companies, to do all the things they were doing. But who is responsible? Only the state. And that's the traditional approach to international human rights law. So with this in mind, let me now talk a bit about business and human rights. There we go. So business and human rights did not begin in 2011, as many of us know. In fact, I've been working in it probably for about 30 years. It certainly wasn't under that name at that time. But the key document which has transformed the understanding of business and human rights are the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And they basically create three pillars. The state has a duty to protect human rights. Companies, business enterprises have a responsibility to respect human rights. There has to be access to remedies. And largely what we've got here is it says these are just existing legal responsibilities on states. Secondly, all business enterprises, big or small, they can all abuse human rights. And that the approach is a smart mix of measures, legislation, regulation, um, corporate activity. That's the kind of framework as of 2011. Now, let's just see. Yes. So, um, as Trevor mentioned, I'm a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Um, but I come here in my personal capacity, not my official capacity. But let me tell you a bit about it. There are five experts from around the world, all divided into various global regions. And so there is somebody who represents Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, Asia, Pacific, Eastern Europe. And I represent this wonderful coherent group called WIOG, which is Western Europe and others. Now, the others, you might have heard of them. One's called Canada. One's called the United States of America. Uh, another's Australia, which is where I'm from, New Zealand, Israel and Turkey. No coherence in any geographic sense. Somehow or other, that's meant to be coherence in UN sense. Anyway, that's that's who I'm meant to represent. Though we all work very much as a group of five together on things. Um, one uh, ac activity we do is that we do country visits. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a couple of my colleagues have just come back from Japan. Um, I'm about to go to Tunisia, in which we go and we do a deep dive in those countries to find out really what's going on there, not just from a distance. We also have a role in terms of complaints. If some person somewhere in the world is um, concerned that a business is acting in a particular way uh, or a state is acting in a way in relation to business, they can bring a complaint to us, what we uh, somehow crazily call a communication. And then 
we can, if we consider this as falls within our remit, we can then write letters to various uh, entities. For example, um, there was a complaint against a Canadian company for exploration in the Okavango region of um, Botswana. Great complaints there about environmental and human rights damage. We write to the Canadian government, we write to the company, we write to the Botswana government, and hopefully they reply. Not always. But we can't take it any further. We have no powers to then actually make a decision. But we can at least highlight this issue and hope it leads to some form of um, engagement, facilitation. Sometimes even a national uh, body might take it up. And sometimes, for example, we just did a recent one against Saudi Aramco, um, the world's biggest um, uh, uh, fossil fuel producer in our concerns about climate change. Why? Because climate change is a human rights issue. It's a business and human rights issue when it's a business doing it. And we wrote to them, we wrote to Saudi Arabia. We also wrote to the 10 largest investors in Saudi Aramco, because without that investment, they would not be able to do what they do. So that's the kind of thing which we do. And in that instance, it's been taken up, for example, by a group of French journalists against the French company. So there will be other generations from these kind of things. Uh, we also, excuse me, <clears throat> we also have many other activities. We do thematic reports and we do uh, annual uh, conferences and things. Thematic reports, we've just released a report on the extractive industry and just transition. Um, and the next report, which I'm leading, is on investors, ESG, environmental, social and governance, and where human rights fits in that. So that's the kind of activities we do. We are beautifully unpaid and we are meant to work uh, somehow or other within all our other jobs and fit all these activities together. OK, the key issue for me, though, is we've talked about the UN guiding principles, talked even about a group such as us who are meant to be acting under them. But is it really law? Well, some would say, well, the UN Human Rights Council um, you know, endorsed it. That, that has to make it law. Sorry, it doesn't. Um, guiding principles themselves say, wait a minute, we're not making international law here. We're actually saying we aren't making international law here. We're just putting together uh, existing principles in a coherent way. However, it's now been applied by many states. 25 or 30 states have issued national action plans on business and human rights. Can Canadian government hasn't. However, they did release a Voices at Risk about human rights defenders in which they said what's up here. They said that Canada is to internationally recognise standards and guidelines of responsible business conduct and refer directly to the UN guiding principles. So there is this sense of state practice which is beginning to follow this. And, as I'll show later, a lot of legislation on this and various kind of businesses, which if you look, in fact, for many major businesses in Canada and elsewhere, many of them will have a human rights policy and many of them will refer to the UN guiding principles. That, of course, does not mean they apply them, just in the same way states don't always implement what they say, but it does show a sense of understanding about this applying. And it's used by civil society in large numbers. So do we say it's law? Well, the, U the former UN uh, High Commissioner on Human Rights called it authoritative state, authoritative, sorry, soft law. But soft law can be lots of things. Soft law can be really it's a guidance that no one really cares about. Soft law can actually be this is the law where it's headed, or it can be clear international standards which are beginning to be put into either international or national legislation. So I think it's much stronger than ordinary, perhaps what we might do to dismiss as soft law. It's quite a powerful sense to which this is where we start when we look at anything to do with uh, business and human rights issues. I just want to say one other thing, which is I'm talking largely from an international law perspective. But business and human rights is not just about public international law. In order to be experts in business and human rights, and you have some fabulous ones in the room, you also have to know a bit about corporate law, a bit about tort law, a bit about environmental law, a bit about private international law, a bit about international and domestic law. There's an awful lot of areas, which probably some of you don't realize you have to know in order to be able to understand the various integrations of these areas, particularly when it's applied in a domestic context. Now, this is where we are with, with, with the law, but 
What about the principles? Well, they've had significant influence. They've influenced a lot of international regulation. The OECD guidelines, now called the Guidelines on Responsible Business Conduct, as of a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, uh, apply to every single major um, developed economy. So obviously it would include Canada in that, Australia, uh, USA, most of Western Europe. There's also the IFC, International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank. They use it in their performance standards, the equator principles, which are about project finance, and of course the International Labour Organization. So we see this broad influence of all of these applying the key principles in relation to um, the UN guiding principles. And as I hinted at and we'll come back to, it's also been affected in relation to things like legislation, business practice and other things. So having that as a context, what is within these uh, UN guiding principles? And apologies for those who know this already. It's, as I said, three pillars. The first pillar is the state um, duty to protect human rights. It's got a range of different guiding principles. Guiding principle one and guiding principle two, uh, three, set out essentially what it's about. And I want you to have a look at that second word. It uses the word must. Now that's fairly unusual in international law. This is a mandatory requirement on governments. States must, it says. This is what states must do, not should or might or may, but must. And the key thing here, as I've highlighted, is prevent, investigate, punish, and redress abuse by business enterprises. So that's quite a clear statement. And I would say it's a statement consistent with existing international law. It doesn't mean states always do it, but there's a range of international law where that has been shown to be the case, where it might be the business activity which is the cause of the dispute, but the state has an obligation un under it. And in fact, one of the oldest cases on this is a transboundary case about environment trail smelter case between Canada and the US where Canada was responsible for a business activity. So it's not new law. And then what should a state do? It talks about enforce laws, not constrain uh, the ability to, um, uh, the other laws to constrain effective guidance and communicate. So these are quite strong statements there by what a state should do. So what are the key issues? The first one is I've already said, these are existing international legal obligations. These aren't new, these are existing. And it's, yeah, what state, a state agent, a state does, state, maybe a state-owned enterprise, but it's also about a non-state activity. I mean, this is quite radical. A non-state activity, a state still has responsibilities to prevent, to redress all those kind of things. And there also is a requirement for policy, policy coherence across the state. I say that because if you're the Minister for Trade or the Minister for Development or whatever, you're probably not that keen on a minister who has responsibility for human rights to say, wait a minute, let's just look at these issues again. But that's what's meant to happen. And who's, which businesses are where, am I talking about? Well, the first thing just to note is the terminology is business enterprises. Probably not a term most of it, us use every day, but it's a term used here because it's meant to cover everything from what we might call companies, corporations, partnerships, maybe a joint venture. It's a whole range of different possibilities. But the entities which the state has a responsibility is not just those business enterprises who are incorporated or registered in the state. It can also be those which are what's called domiciled. So it could be their main uh, headquarters are there, the main part of their business is, is there. So it's actually set quite a wide net. The example I would use, for example, in the UK where I live is that Primark, which is one of the major clothes shop shops, is actually Irish registered, but it's headquarters and its main place of business in the UK, so the UK has responsibility for it. But a key issue in all this is how far does this responsibility go? Why do I ask that? Because international law puts quite strict limitations. Why? Because of sovereignty. No one state likes another state interfering in what it does. 
And every state says, no, your jurisdiction, your powers only go to the edge of your territory. But it's not quite so simple. In the whole idea of state responsibility, a state can be have what's called attribution to it of an activity which is not it itself hasn't done. So for example, it's a private military companies, and there are very many, if they undertake activity on behalf of the state, the state has that responsibility. Export credit agencies, if they're not government owned, they are making big decisions in relation to a whole lot of issues, encouraging business to go elsewhere. They could also have the extension of state responsibility. And the courts have said, jurisdiction doesn't just stop at the end of your territory in relation to human rights. The International Court of Justice, in the case between Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, made it very clear that international human rights instruments are applicable outside the territory of the state. But the UN Guiding Principles isn't so clear. In the commentary to Guiding Principle um, 2, it kind of hedges it. It says, well, there's no obligation to, there's no obligation not to, and that's been deeply criticised. And since 2011, there's been a significant development forward. Uh, the two major human rights treaty bodies have both made it very clear that a state's obligations, both to, in its own obligations for its own action, but in relation to business activities, extend beyond the territory if the business activities are beyond. Now, how do we square that? Well, the argument is the state, yes, can only control the business which is domiciled in its territory. But if that business's activities are elsewhere, its subsidiaries, its um, supply chain, the state in its territory can pass laws in relation to that, and states do. The Modern Slavery Act, which has just been passed in Canada, it does that. So it's not quite as tricky as often it's looked like. And in fact, the terminology I use, for which I give credit to Sarah Sek, is why do we always use extraterritorial? Surely the better word in this instance is transnational jurisdiction. Why? Because we're talking about transnational companies. The jurisdiction follows their activities. Whereas extraterritorial is usually in relation to state to state activities. So I think that also, in my engagement with states, sort of takes away a little bit of this apparent sovereignty limitations which can appear. So already we see business and human rights developments pushing away from the traditional international law position. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we see this in what is now some of the starting points of regulation on this area. I'm pretty proud of this slide, it took ages to put together. Um, anyway, this gives you a rough idea of some of the regulation law activity which is going on. One's in Boulder, fairly recent legislation. What we see is more and more regulation on business and human rights. And perhaps the most dramatic is coming up. The European uh, Union is going to pass the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, and that is going to be transformative. However, there is already existing law in France, in Norway, in Germany, in Sierra Leone, in Australia, in Canada, and the US uses it through their customs method. So there's a whole range of different regulation going on right now. And I say this because governments and businesses need to be aware of this. It's a fairly global movement and it's a significant movement. Hence, a lot of what I'm talking about is how this regulation is beginning to affect and make changes because it is quite significant. And down the bottom, you'll see I talk about the treaty. The fact that's going on this week, it's one of the first times I've missed it. Um, it's a fascinating thing. The working group as such doesn't have, excuse me, <clears throat> a role on this. But it's quite important, though, because potentially it will lead to um, international obligations. I have to say, uh, within these non-official terms, I don't see it happening immediately. It's going to happen, but not 
in the next year or so. I mean, my experience going there is there's still a lot of education needed of states about what's involved and still a lot of disputes as to what it should contain. I would just flag, I don't think a framework treaty is going to work. We already have that. It's UN guiding principles on business and human rights. It exists. So we need to begin putting the, the legal elements of that much more closely into a treaty. But we'll see where that goes. But of course, if it goes, then it's a matter of which states ratify it and then which states implement it. So that's just, it kind of shows you the kind of development really of regulation in this area, which is quite significant. So that's pillar one. Let me just move to pillar two. Oh, move too far, sorry. There we go. Uh, uh, pillar two um, looks at relation to, okay, what is this business responsibility to respect? And they're divided into three elements, where they cause or they contribute to the adverse human rights impact by their own activities, or they are directly linked through their business relationships. Now, we can kind of understand a cause where a business does something directly. Contribute to might be, let's say you're a fashion uh, retailer, let's say you're plucking a, an example out of the air, Lululemon, Canadian company, and you suddenly realize it, the, the summer weather has gone into October, you don't have your summer stock anymore, and yet you put in line very strong provisions of working conditions down your supply chain, we suddenly want more stock and you want it now. You could contribute to the consequences of adverse labor conditions down your supply chain. And what about directly linked? This is where a lot of issues happen, which is where through a contract, through a supply chain, through a value chain, a company is seen as being directly linked to the consequences. So that that is often where it will occur. And, and businesses have that responsibility. They can't just say, we didn't do it. That is not enough. And this is quite an innovative element of this. Um, of the guiding principles. So what we see is, once again, as I said before, it's all business enterprises. Why? Because the shop selling the coffee you're now drinking, maybe they've got child labor there. Maybe they haven't checked the way that, where that coffee's come from. Could also be in you know, a massive company, you know, a Hud Bay or whatever. I mean, these are big companies, you know, Loblaws, whatever, which of course could be doing it, but so can your small um, uh, small enterprise. And we're all internationally human rights, not just some. And I find time and time again when I'm talking to companies, I'll say, oh yes, the human rights issues we're concerned about are A and B. I can give an example. I worked with a telecommunication company and they said, well, the key human rights issues are our priority are freedom of expression and national security limitations on that. I said, great. What about when you put a cable across land and you force all the people off that land? Are there human rights issues there? Never thought about it. So we have to be very careful not to think in advance what the human rights issues are, because there could be many. And I'll look at how they're meant to do that in a moment. Um, and businesses have the power of leverage. In a world where of the top 100 economies, 50% of them are going to be businesses, they have a lot of power, not just over other corporations, but over the states. So using their leverage, either by themselves or maybe as a sector, can make a big difference. The key aspect, the key aspect in all this is we look at impact on the rights holders. Not impact on the company, impact on the rights holders. I'll explain that in just a moment. And it's an ongoing responsibility, not a one-off, it's ongoing. And this responsibility to respect is irrespective of the national law. And that's probably one of the hardest things companies understand. Say, we're complying with the law. Say, well, when the law, when the law might say, or the guidance might say you have to pregnancy test every single woman, is that really what you want to comply with? And maybe the law isn't so clear. Maybe you can avoid that kind of issue. But compliance with national law cannot be the start and end point. Why? Because we all know the states that, are, uh, that breach human rights law. Every state does in some way or other. And if we say, oh no, we're ha happy with what every state law is, how can we say companies just need to comply with state law? That makes no coherent sense. But you'll hear it again and again, companies saying, well, we comply with the law. 
think about ways around it. I was involved in a company that was in, uh, working in Asia and they said, that company says we have to employ somebody of that nationality. And the company said, yeah, but our human rights policy, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of work policy says we won't discriminate against people on the basis of their gender, their sexuality, their nationality, etc." I said, well, how do we work around it? So what they did was a notional CEO was in that country. The real CEO sat outside that country. There are ways to still comply with international human rights law if you think imaginatively. So this is constant refrain. Companies have this role, which is more than just compliance with national law. And then a key element, which I probably spent way too much of my research time on, is what is human rights due diligence? Here I steal from the OECD because they can do these um, diagrams much better than I can. The starting point is you need a policy. And it needs to be determined at high level and it needs to be serious, not just one of these policies that are put in a kind of drawer and no one ever looks at. And then you need to do human rights impact assessment, which is number two. You need to identify and you need to assess what these adverse impacts are. And this is really crucial because if you don't do that, and in that you have to undertake stakeholder engagement, asking those on the ground what, what do they see as their human rights impacts and not do like my telecommunication, just ignore a whole lot because you decide in advance what they are. You can prioritise, I'm not saying that. Of course, a company can prioritise for most severe risks or the most present risks, but you don't ignore the others, which can often happen. So you do that and then somehow or other, you mean to then do your best to cease, prevent or mitigate. And then you track what you've done. Have we done it? What should we do? Let's go back. Let's refer. It's ongoing. And then you have to communicate. Now, I tell you, when talking to general counsel, legal counsel of companies, they hate this idea of communicate. They don't want to be out there sort of showing what they're not doing well. Of course they don't. But the communication is crucial because it can also be helpful for that company. I can give you an example. Nestle has 140,000 first tier suppliers. You'd have thought impossible to find out what our human rights impact are, is. Very difficult. They have nevertheless done mapping, for example, in their cocoa industry. And they, yeah, with the Danish Institute of Human Rights, and they found problems. And they said, oh, we shouldn't really release this report. They did. Why? Because it showed they're trying to act on this. Eventually, in fact, there was a case against them, Barber against Nestle before the Californian courts. And they relied on this to say, look, we're doing our best. And they were successful. And I'd prefer companies to try than just give up. It's risky. I accept that. Not always straightforward. And certainly in some of the cases I've been involved with, companies slightly regret some of the things they put in the public uh, phase. But putting in the public phase and public sphere and you're not doing it is worse. At least if you're trying to do it, you have some sense of uh, taking responsibility on this. And of course, always remembering, provide for some kind of means of um, uh, to remediate where necessary and such like. And um, this is kind of the whole idea of human rights due diligence. I want to say one other thing about human rights due diligence, because I know I've got some business people here. Due diligence and human rights due diligence are not the same. If you ever worked in a company, you do your due diligence, let's say when you're buying another company because you're worrying about the liabilities, the risk to the company. Human rights due diligence is about the human rights risks. That's where you look and then the consequence to your, um, uh, to your business. They are not the same. They can seem the same. Often even us in our, our discussions say due diligence. It's human rights due diligence. Remember the human at the heart of it because it's a rights holder's impact which is crucial. Now, when we think of businesses, we generally think businesses are just not interested in this area. And one of my favourite cartoons, here we have a business person saying to the doctor, lately I've been feeling ethical, can you prescribe something for that? You possibly think, well, this is the norm. This is really, you know, businesses do not want to be ethical. 
interesting thing is, I've been involved, a lot of my um, research work, as Trevor mentioned, is empirical. I go out and ask businesses what they do. Do endless surveys, not always easy to get them to reply, but I did one on behalf of the European Commission. And this is the outcome. We surveyed 631 respondents. Not easy, did interviews, did um, uh, round tables and things. And the, this was about whether or not the EU should bring in any law in relation to human rights due diligence and how would businesses respond. If you, if you, maybe you can see from this graph, it, it's the far right, whatever I'm colorblind, so whatever the color is on the right hand side, um, over 70% of businesses want the law. This might be shocking. They want the law for lots of reasons. They want, as some of these in, things indicate, they want legal certainty, they want harmonization, they want to know leverage over those in their value chain. And of course, what isn't quite there, they want it for competitive reasons. If you are a business who is trying your best to do your human rights due diligence, and your competitor undercuts you because let's say they're using child labor, that's not in your interest. So actually you want this law. So the surprising thing is that we see time and time again, because I've done lots of these kind of studies, and there's actually even one in Canada, it's called Canadian Business Insights from York University, um, from the business school, which shows there is this desire for significant number of companies about wanting some clarity in the law, rather than the kind of uncertainty that exists now. So when we reflect back on that cartoon, it's not necessarily that representative anymore. So what about the last pillar? Access to remedies, too often neglected pillar. But here again, we have that word must. And it happens twice, guiding principle one, and guiding principle 25. States must take appropriate steps to ensure through judicial, administrative and other means, an effective remedy. States must. Do they do that? Far from it. And the commentary to, says, what kind of remedy are we looking for? Well, what we're looking for is an effective judicial mechanism without barriers to access. And I've been involved in cases which I can tell you take years and years. Why? Because if you are somebody in the global south who is, let's say, the company is polluting your river, Firstly, you often don't have the language of human rights to even know that. You've got to find a lawyer or someone like that who can help you on that. You may not speak the same language as the company. And then you've got to find out which company is it. Because I can tell you the name of the company on, I don't know, in Peru will not be the same number in, same name of the company in the UK or US or Canada or whatever. So it's very, very hard. Then you finally to begin, find somebody who can help you take the case to the court. Um, you then have to argue the case not in human rights language, ha, no way. You have to argue it in some tort language, which might be negligence, what is that? They have to, or trespass to the person, what is that? You have to use these domestic law terms, which are not human rights terms. And then you've got to come up, the court will say, well, wait a minute, it should have been held back in Peru. Why are you before us? So overcome all of these, that's called Latin's forum non convenience. This isn't the right place. And then you finally get, a single judge you might say oh yeah well there's a possibility here and then it goes on appeal because a company will always have more money than you even have and finally it'll get to the highest court and the court will say well let's say they say at the best yes we have jurisdiction you've gone 12 years and you've got to that stage you still don't have a remedy all you've got is a court saying yes we can look at the case it is really hard and there may be 0.2 percent of all the cases that could happen in this area so it's very hard to get a remedy there are non-judicial remedies. The main one in this area is the national contact points. There's a national contact point here in Canada. And uh, they can make uh, decisions on a complaint in relation to a, a number of matters. The experience of them is at best haphazard. Largely, there was a survey of them, most you don't find a remedy for the victim. They might say company needs to do more, but on the whole being pretty ineffective. Um, and the key issue which we often forget, 
a remedy, and the working group did an excellent report on this before my time, a remedy is only a remedy if it's a remedy to the rights holder. That's why I'm always worried when a, there's legislation which says, we'll fine the company. Where does the fine go? Certainly doesn't go to the victim, goes into the state's coffers. Now, even in the cases where there's company, uh, individuals, executives might be put in, in, in criminal court. Where does the remedy go to the victim? It doesn't go. So you have to be very, very careful on this. I'm also a mediator, as Trevor said, and sometimes mediation, you can get a quicker, more direct remedy. One of the mediations I did recently, it led to um, uh, having a reliable, long-term medical facility in the community. Didn't exist before, had reliable water in the community. None of those would come up in a court case. The most you're gonna get is dumping some part of the community with money. So you have to be very careful about what remedy we're seeking. And a core issue, which is business too often neglect, is put in place an operational grievance mechanism on your mine, on your factory, allow those working there and the community to have some grievance mechanism. Often these cases will go away and there'll be some direct uh, consequence for those involved, particularly the vulnerable and marginalised. So if I've got time, I'm going to briefly mention some cases, just so you know the context, where there has now been access remedy. And what you'll note, these are all recent. The Vedanta case, I have to declare I was involved in this one, the first case ever by a superior court in any country in the world which had said a parent company has a duty of care for the actions which its subsidiary do, does which infringe human rights of people. In that instance in Zambia, it was a UK case significant step. Why? Because those of you doing company law know, wait a minute, every company is a separate legal entity. How dare you walk through that co corporate veil? Court was very canny. We're not saying that. We're saying they have a direct duty, not through the subsidiary. They have a direct duty. Why? Because in some ways they manage or control the subsidiary. <clears throat> and so the courts are getting more alert to this. In the um, uh, Nigerian Farmers Against Shell case for the Dutch courts, they actually said, and Shell, you need to do things like cap these oil leaks, clean up the pollution. And then in the Milieu de Fonsi and Shell case, the court said, wait a minute, on climate change, you also have an obligation. Using the UN guiding principles, using the Paris Agreement on climate change, they said, Shell, you need to reduce your global CFC output by 2035. That's a very powerful statement. It's on appeal, but it's fascinating what that court has said. But it's not just within the kind of narrow domestic courts. In, in the international arbitration cases, cases like Obasa against Argentina, all about basically when a company had the access to water, sorry, had the right to deal with the water, and actually, they weren't getting much money from those who are poorer than not. So Argentina said, wait a minute, you're not providing the water you should be providing. The court said, yes, Sir Bassa, you do have international human A major case for the Canadian Supreme Court. I'm going to come back to that in a, in a minute. Oh, it's got to jump back forward. Um, the, the case against ANZ. ANZ is an Australian bank. They give a lot of funding to a um, sugar manufacturer in Cambodia, did they do their human rights due diligence? No. Had they done that, they'd have known that this company was using the funds they had basically to steal land from the rightful landowners, push them off their own land. The Australian NCP said, ANZ, you did not do your human rights due diligence. There was a consequence. And ANZ, to its enormous credit, accepted this, they paid compensation, they put, it in, put in place a pretty good operational grievance mechanism. They recognised they, as the financial company, still had an obligation. And finally, just to mention, in, in, Fr in France, there's also a case in Sweden and elsewhere, direct cases against executives for breaches of international law. In that case, Amesis and Nexa, Nexa the, it was where this company, hardware and software company, sold to the Libyans. They all celebrated, they got massive bonuses. Did they even think that the Libyan government, then run by Gaddafi, would then use that 
to torture, kill and harm their opposition? Of course not. Had they done their human rights due diligence, they'd have seen that. Consequence being that actually they're now before war crimes court. So these are just some of the cases that are happening at a significant level. So having said all this, to draw some of this um, together, what are the general impacts? Well, what we see in this is an increasing national, regional and international regulation. We see increasing case law and access to remedies, not just in one sector, but in many. We see increased business awareness. We're still a long way from that, but increased business awareness. And I think small and medium sized enterprises are saying, way, this is too hard. But many of them are actually down the supply or value chain of a company. So they will have to take this on board. We see demands by consumers and some investors. And the financial sector, as I've already hinted at in that last case, they are also responsible. I, I, I'm particularly interested in that, my own interest, but also the working group put a submission to the uh, European Union to say the financial sector needs to be part of legislation. I, I, so I've already given that case. And as John Ruggie, who was one of the drafters of the, well, key drafter of the UN guiding principles, who is, of course, Canadian, he said, governments should not assume they're helping business by failing to provide adequate guidance for them. So in fact, there is this responsibility. So what does that mean perhaps for Canada? Well, <clears throat> there will be some impact, for example, of the EU laws and other laws, <clears throat> the Norwegian transparency law, for example, because they will apply to Canadian companies who are operating outside Canada, particularly in the EU. The types of legislation is growing towards um, mandatory human rights due diligence. And so we have to be careful when we look at things like the Canadian Mining, uh, sorry, Modern Slavery Act. We'll see that firstly only covers some rights, rights related to modern slavery. Secondly, reporting requirements have been shown, and there's a, some excellent reviews of this. Simply reporting does not change corporate action. In fact, there's a fabulous example out of Germany, the German government in its national action plan said, well, we think companies are already doing human rights due diligence, they're reporting on it, etc. They then found out that 17, one seven percent of companies were actually doing it. So they brought in legislation because they realized reporting was not going to change. Um, uh, also, I think, and, and I know there'll be some discussion of this probably tomorrow at the conference, um, corporate law is a big issue. I mean, I think directors should have, I think quite strongly, directors should have a duty of care in relation to this, and it should be part of their fiduciary duties. That would be transformative. Then at the highest level, directors and senior management in a company would have to take this into account. They wouldn't just say, oh, well, we'll leave it to our operations. And of course, legal development, I've already talked about those kind of things. There's often a very different view of Canadian businesses here and elsewhere. I say the same of Australian businesses, just by the way, that somehow or other they're, you know, they're fine in their own country. But the working group has, I think it's 16 um, uh, communications against Canadian businesses, primarily in the mining sector, but also in the fashion sector. So that elsewhere, particularly in the mining sector, there is significant negative comments about um, Canadian companies. I've already mentioned this extension to climate change. No longer is it limited to what we might consider the some kind of human rights. And I think there are risks, real risks to Canadian companies if they're not doing this. Reputational risk, operational risk, litigation risk, of course financial risk, competition risk, they are very real risks. The difficulty sometimes, I'm in the middle of this consultation about ESG, is they're not considered material risks. To the person on the ground, of course they're material, but actually they're more and more material to companies. Why? Because it's part of the strategic risk to a company. It is absolutely clear that that affects companies' reputation. In a, in a world where CEOs get sacked more often today 
for personal, private, social matters than financial matters, we can't disregard social risks as real risks to business. And of course, um, rights holders, consumers, purchasers, investors, they're going to be looking at what's happening and thinking about value chains, not just supply chains, but where you sell goods to are also relevant. And particularly remember, obviously, context of Indigenous persons and other communities. Okay, I just have two more slides, which are just to bring us back to where we started, which was the traditional international human rights law, which I told you is about state action, state responsibility. Hopefully what I've shown you here is, well, these are beginning to test this. And the, perhaps the case which highlights this most brilliantly is, of course, the Nevson case. Now, many of you will know it. I'm sorry, this is a repeat, and just very briefly the facts. Um, here we're talking about Eritrean uh, refugees in Canada complaining that they were um, subject to forced labour and other things because of the forced military service in Eritrea. And they're forced to work in a mine which was um, jointly owned or partly owned by a Canadian company. The big question is, here was customary international law, the international which applies to every country whether or not they've ratified a treaty. Can it apply here to a CPCG or a joint venture that has allegedly conducted torture and slavery in another country? Judge Abella fabulous judge of the uh, former judge of the Supreme Court in the majority said this international law has so fully expanded beyond its Grotian origins Grotian origins are what I said this strict state individual division that there are no longer any tenable basis for restricting the application of customary international law to relations between states that may mean that Eritrean workers customary international claims need not be converted into newly recognized categories of torts to succeed. That's an extraordinary statement. That is saying international law can be used against a company in its own state for actions they did elsewhere. And that's an extraordinary powerful statement. We'll see where that goes in terms of other cases, but it's an interesting move forward. So what does that now mean in terms of where I began, where international law is and what, public, what business and human rights has done? Well, the starting point is this extraordinary acceptance by states that businesses have human rights responsibility, this extraordinary acceptance by businesses, this amazing acceptance by the UN. The Working Group on Business Rights sits in the UN, uh, the Office of the High Commission for Human Rights in Geneva. I've sat in meetings with states where they've all voted in favour of a business responsibility on human rights. That is extraordinary. If you knew where I began in 1993 talking to an extractive sector where they said, "Way, well, hey, human rights are nothing to do with us, and states saying human rights are only to do with us, to 30 years later, where they are all saying, yes, of course, businesses have responsibilities of human rights. We're not saying they're implementing them, just like we don't say states all implement their human rights responsibility, but we're saying they have them. I mean, that is a radical, radical change. It challenges these ideas of state sovereignty. It challenges these ideas of jurisdiction. And it clearly expands corporate rights and responsibilities, which we see in other areas, in international environmental law, international investment law, uh, and, and, and elsewhere in climate change, for example. And so the expectation of regulation about businesses under an international flag has definitely changed. So let us reflect from where we've come. I'll begin with a quotation from Penelope Simons, one of the great international lawyers here in Canada. This is what she says. Oh, nothing at all. This is what she says. She says, the root causes of this corporate impunity is historical that states have for centuries been trying to help businesses and not allow them to have any kind of responsibility. That this has led to the undermining of third world states to be able to have control over businesses. Classic example, the uh, East India Company, um, which basically ran India for centuries propped up by the UK government, which then leads us to Christoph Schroer saying, we need to rethink our mentality. 
We need to adjust our intellectual framework. We might begin to realize here is a multi-layered reality, not of this strict state individual, but of much, much more. So that the possibilities within international law generally, but particularly with business and human rights, are so much more dramatic and hopefully will begin to focus on actually the people on the ground, many of whom in their daily lives are much more affected by corporation. They're probably working in a factory or they're selling their goods to a corporation or the corporation's polluting their waters. We need to begin realising that, that business human rights is beginning to do this still an early stage, but in doing so, it's also beginning to transform the international legal framework. Thank you. So I think we definitely have some time for some questions. So if you have a question in the room, if you could come up to one of the microphones on either side of the room. And I'm also, if, for those of you that are online, if you have a question, I'm also monitoring the chat. And maybe for speed, I can take a few questions at once if that's helpful. Please. Thanks so much. Um, this was an amazing lecture, honestly. Um, so I have a couple of questions. The first question is, um, does this lead to more forum shopping? And the second one is, given that remedies are often better in global North countries, uh, would that lead to inter-jurisdictional conflicts as far as enforcement is concerned? That's okay, great questions. So I'll answer those in a minute. Yes, next person. Um, while, um, while like international human rights law is limited to um, um, domestic matters, which explains why there's tend to be more civil actions, particularly in the environmental and health areas, does not the must component in uh, international human rights law technically impose a positive obligation on states to actively regulate uh, um, trend uh, extraterritorial behavior, which then leads into issues of custom, customary international law, as you just saw with the ARIA in the uh, SEC over here. And so do you expect to see litigation to increase as a result of that? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, professor, I would like to raise the issue of the participation of attorneys from the field, from the countries where human rights abuses uh, may occur or environmental um, damage may occur. And uh, this is in connection with the leadership, the leading role of uh, lawyers, attorneys, barristers from the countries where the corporations, inter transnational uh, companies come from. So how, how can we involve attorneys from the countries affected more? Thank you. Thank you for those three questions. They're, they're very, very helpful. Um, forum shopping. Um, let me start the issue of forum shopping from a different angle. Companies do forum shopping. I mean, as Marcus will tell you much better than I will, in international investment law, if you have, uh, if a company doesn't like what the state is doing in relation to its its own actions, they will bring an action to an international um, investment tribunal. They won't go. To, they won't take action in that state. They will go elsewhere for it. Um, so that already happens. I can give you an example from the Vedanta case. Um, in that case, Vedanta, which was a company um, who was also operating in um, Zambia, said this case should be in Zambia. Why? Because they felt if it went back to Zambia they would be able to use their um, influence much more for the case to be dropped. So forum shopping can come from more than one side. In fact, I, I think I gave the example before how hard it is even to bring a case very often um, in, in these instances so that um, the, uh, the forum shopping is often dependent on where the company's from. And that's why we end up mainly in a way as, as, as you noted, the remedies in the global north, not the global south. I would much, much prefer 
for those involved, all those involved, that the remedy was in the global south. The trouble is, and this picks up the, the last question, often there are not lawyers with that expertise. I already showed, I hope, that business and human rights is not an easy area to get into. It's, in fact, you do less human rights and more corporate law than anything else. Um, and it's very hard, therefore, to build that capacity. Um, I would love that capacity to be built. I see that part of my role in the working group to try and assist in that. I can give you an example where a um, a law firm, this maybe answers the last question, a law firm in the uh, UK called Lee Day de deliberately worked with a South African law firm so that future cases in South Africa are now brought by that law firm, not by the UK law firm. But I think unfortunately we're still a long way from that. But that happens in lots of other areas where climate change is still very much one where the, it's very much still largely a global north um, instance, but they're, they're both very fair questions. Excuse me. <clears throat> In relation to civil actions, a positive duty uh, to act. Well, there is a positive duty under. Uh, treaties such as the European Court on Human Rights has made clear positive duties in relation to Russia and environmental damage in relation to Spain and environmental damage. Uh, oh, sorry, the Russian case was about kind of landslides. Um, so they have said the state, you need to act on this. Um, so there is some of those positive duties. Um, but unfortunately, in a lot of human rights, the, the states tend not to take on the positive duties um, or else they only look at some human rights. They look, say, at civil and political rights and they ignore, say, for example, the right to health or the right to education. Um, and I think that's problematic in terms of what cases. For example, if let's say your right to health was breached, it's actually very hard to bring a case in a Global North case based on that. What tort are you talking about? What kind of um, other obligation which you can take as a claim in a national court? It's actually really very, very hard. Um, and very interesting, I was, you know, the Nevison case is a fascinating case where you brought the case was you know, slavery and torture, both of which can kind of be rephrased into a tort. Um, <coughs> excuse me, so it's actually very difficult. I just want to add, you talk about civil claims, you're right too. Interestingly enough, in continental Europe, a lot of the claims are, claims are criminal claims because there's more control by the prosecutor and often there allows a parallel civil claim. So it's not all civil claims, um, but it, it, most of the cases still are within um, uh, sort of the, the civil position. Thank you. Any other questions in the floor? Yep. Thanks for the very insightful lecture, Professor. Um, Within the context of international investment law, um, to what extent would you agree that beyond the implementation of um, FDI screening regimes that focus primarily on national security, to what extent would you encourage developing countries to implement sustainability screening regimes? And here, um, I'm, I'm looking at jurisdictions that are making significant inroads like the UK, um, Canada, with the case of Nelson and Araya, um, and other jurisdictions like in, in, in France. Do you think developing countries, as part of screening FDIs from these countries, should, 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 they should consider FDIs from such destinations as more, more attractive? Because when it comes to um, the, implement, um, the enforcement of sustainability standards like human rights, uh, these countries are in a better position to, to, to even seek what, what, what you are now saying, we should look at it from um, transnational enforcement than extraterritorial. And then um, the next question, sorry, I think I just lost it. Once a second, please, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the next question is, um, how effective would you consider public responses from developed countries uh, when issues of human rights violations by multinationals come up? To what extent do you think um, public sentiment, public participation discourages multinationals from violating human rights? No. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, you going to ask a question? Uh, yes, I will collect and correct. Yes, uh, I'm Dirk Matten. I'm a professor of uh, corporate social responsibility at the business school. Fantastic. School. Wonderful to have someone from the business school. <clears throat> exactly. And this uh, question comes, this question comes, of course, from the shallow end of science, 
as business schools are. <laughs> um, so I have been uh, working in this area for almost 30 years. Uh, including in Nottingham with Jeremy Moon, who oh, I, know him I think well. you know, yep. and who speaks very highly of you. Um, the, um, the, the interesting question for me as a business school professor really is that um, if I talk about human rights and business obligations, I am very much walking in a Westphalian world where ultimately the authority for these things are nation states on delegated authority by nation states, which of course clashes very much with uh, the entity we are teaching in a business school, which is a multinational corporation that transcends these boundaries and arbitrates and takes advantage of it. And when I talk to my friends in the law uh, community, they often, uh, when we, you know, move to the end of the discussion, they say, you know, making business responsible or create obligations for business with regard to human rights. Uh, that's doctrinally excessive. I like that. <laughs> you know, I, I never forget that. So do you see a perspective where we can move on to this, where we can uh, give this more teeth and make these obligations more palpable for corporations? Because I am sick and tired of working in a world for 30 years where everything is voluntary and you have the good corporations who maybe do or not things. Are there ways to give this debate more teeth? Heaven, do you want to do question for your oh, question? Quite. So there's a question online. So uh, just uh, uh, it's from a gentleman called Ryan. So thank you, Professor, for this great presentation. Let's practice it correctly. It says, my question is, with regards to Pillar 3, do you feel that a business and human rights treaty is the best approach to ensuring victims access to effective remedy? Or do you feel that human rights provision should be inserted into international investment agreements and providing access to remedy through international arbitration? Okay, great. Thank you. They're all fabulous questions. You're, I'll come to you last because I think you ask lots of different flavors. So let me actually begin with that last online question from Ryan. Um, I don't think there are alternatives, either a treaty or including human rights obligations in investment and trade treaties. In fact, one of the drafts um, of the current treaty does to look at, you know, to what extent should those investment and trade treaties be interpreted in light of the development in business and human rights, which is a pretty recent development, as I've shown. Um, and it'll be interesting whether states sign up to that because many of them don't really want that. At the same stage, as you know, there's this pull away a little bit from using international in, in, uh, investment arbitration because there's a concern that um, uh, states are not able to use human rights and other kind of uh, matters of public policy, which they'd like to, because the corporation will make those decisions. So I don't see them as alternatives. I see them as possibly working together. Um, in relation to the, uh, the first question um, about um, international investment law and FDI, uh, foreign direct investment, that is, um, it's interesting because one of the greatest investments at the moment, say, in Africa and Asia is from China. What does that mean in human rights terms? What does that mean? How do we engage with this? Um, oddly enough, um, China has also taken action under its international investment treaties where it feels that its company hasn't been treated well by the particular state. So it does engage in these issues. Human rights is obviously a problematic issue to raise directly, but environment is not. There's already, uh, China has a number of guidance in its Belt and Road policies which talk about the environment. So I think there are ways in to have these discussions rather than making a necessary division between kind of some uh, corporations from some states and others, because I think it does vary quite a bit. Um, and you talk about the public response from um, the Third World Global, Global South on, on these issues. I guess I've just come back from Central Asia where it's very hard to have a public response beyond what the leader says. 
And I think we have to be wary of assuming there is always a public response when it may be very hard to find that voice and sort of trying to find out really what are those on the ground saying. How often are they really saying, no, we're not interested in human rights, probably pretty rarely, but they don't, won't be able to have that opportunity even to get their voice heard. So it's a, it's a fair question. I think it's quite a hard question always to be able to dig deep enough. And that's why one of human rights due diligence is talk to the rights holders, not to the state, to the rights holders, find out really what they're looking at. And then to that, broad and wide question on um, sort of business and uh, kind of how they operate. I guess what I would say, and I'm sure you do this anyway, you get some of the big, say, Canadian companies in the room or some of the great finance uh, institutions in Canada, um, uh, which are such as the Bank of Montreal, which actually are interested in these kind of uh, issues. It'd be very, I'd be staggered if they said in that room, human rights have nothing to do with us. Absolutely staggered because that's not what they're saying publicly. That's absolutely not what they're saying publicly. They don't, we don't always like it and they may limit what they're saying, but that's what I'm hearing. I would also say that, um, uh, of course they're saying the authority to say, as I said, that's what I heard 30 years ago. But hopefully what I've tried to show is that's where it's moving. And I love your comment about uh, doctrinally excessive. Probably what I'm saying now and have just said would be considered completely doctrinally excessive in many, many law schools in the world. I mean, you're lucky you've got someone like Benali here because you know it's not so excessive to say that. But absolutely, if you are in a law school, which is what I would call a positivist law school, the laws come from states, that's all we're looking at. What I've said is outrageous. And yet it's coherent, I hope, um, in terms of where it is moving. So that I absolutely respect what you're saying, but I also what are we now calling these terminologies, actually I think matters a little bit. Um, I would also add one other thing, which um, one of the big issues is often the lack of a rule of law. Now, Professor Stephen Tipp would be much better place than I am to talk about this, but if there's not a rule of law in a state, it's very, very hard to seek any of these remedies. And so yes, the state is still very present. If there's not a rule of law there, can you rely on the judiciary? Probably not. Can you rely on government to assist you? Probably not. Can you even find a lawyer who's prepared to help you? Possibly not. So I think those are real issues which affect how states respond. The same states there are clearly going to be some rule of law states which are going to be more open to the possibility of engagement in this. Um, and certainly I've sat in parliamentary committee bodies in fact, I've been an advisor and one, where we have state, we have a company sitting in front of us saying, yes, we want more regulation on this. We want you, the state, to regulate because we are currently regulating it ourselves and we want more. So that I guess I'm, uh, of course, you know, I also deal with what 1,100 complaints, which we deal with where companies are not doing this, where states are not doing that. But I do think we are moving, I would hope, to the stage where doctrinally we are moving towards a much more nuanced approach and far less um, far less kind of binary in looking at these issues. But thanks for that question. So I just wanted to say thank you very much to Professor McCorkadale for coming in here today and giving this amazing talk, which we enjoyed very much. And as a token of our gratitude, please take with you much Osgood swag Whoa. so that you can tell the world who we are. And just as a last thing, I'm going to make a plug as well. So I am hosting a conference, which Professor McCorkadale will be at tomorrow, including we will be having wonderful speakers, many of whom are already in the room. So if you could also please join us tomorrow, we would be very grateful for that as well. It's both in person and online. So thank you very much and hope to see you again tomorrow.